You know what it is each and every time. It's your boy, Young Guru, a.k.a. The Glue, a.k.a. Hank McCoy, a.k.a. Nada Brahma. Y'all always know that I'm rocking with Hard Knock each and every time. Let's go. I'm making the transition from the studio to the classroom and mm -hmm. what are you doing at SC? I think it was just a natural progression of one of the things that I would normally do, which is to teach people, but in a really informal way. And when I started to go around and do a lot of talks and a lot of speaking, people were asking questions and it just started to develop um, of me trying to teach people. So I think the thing that I'm doing with USC is just something that was naturally something that I probably would have gotten into anyway, but thank God for USC that they gave me a vehicle and a venue to actually teach and to, to have a formal place to put this education down to a bunch of students. My mom's a teacher. They say that teachers often learn the most from, from their students. Oh, absolutely. Uh, what, what are some of the things that just working with, with the students you learn? It's just fun to interact with the youth and to actually see where their minds are at a given time and sort of put into perspective that someone who's a freshman in college and they're 18 years old, you know, was born in 1996. And that's a, that's a crazy thing to think about. For me, I get to draw so much from the students in terms of their experience and where they are. And it sort of keeps me young and keeps me up to date and fresh. And sometimes uh, over the years, you formulate all these opinions and, and especially older hip hop producers or engineers, we have all these rules that we follow and the kids don't follow the same rules. So it's like, okay, you are, you're constantly relearning to break down some of your barriers that you've built up over the years. It's kind of crazy that when I mean, you're teaching SC, mm -hmm. not just teaching at Harvard, mm -hmm. it's like to have hip hop in, in a higher education, like what, what, what does that mean for, for hip hop and, and its growth? We've always said that you could take the poetry of hip hop and teach it as classes. There's so much that can be learned from not just the lyrics, but the production and um, the social context of why these albums were made. But it's great to see that people are finally recognizing hip hop as something that's so important that it should be in these arenas and be taught. I think one of the greatest things for me was when I went to Cornell to check out the hip hop exhibit that they have. They actually have like Africa Bambada's notebook next to ancient Egyptian scrolls. So you see the respect level. This is all in a temperature controlled room with like fireproof walls and fireproof cases. And like you really value that notebook and see the, the historical value in Africa Bambada's notebook the same way that we now see the historical value in some ancient Egyptian scroll. You know, that, that, that that's a huge statement. So just people collecting all these things, finally giving um, a historical context to all these things and putting it in a university setting to where someone is studying this and documenting all these things. The, the only problem that I have with it is that you have to be really careful as to who is the information giver and what information that they're giving. And the great thing about hip hop is that the people who created this, the forefathers, our founding fathers, are still alive. It's, it's sort of that thing where if you're a pilot, imagine if you could be able to talk to the Wright brothers, right? These are not only just pilots, but these are people who created the, the idea of flying a plane. You know, that t sort of thing. It's like to be able to talk to the person who created the culture and realize that they won't be here forever. So you have to take into account that that factor exists. You know, one of the things that just struck me and, and, and it just brought this home for me was that my college roommate, his father was Amiri Baraka, right? Amiri Baraka lived a, less than a block, caddy corner to my house, less than a block away from me. And I don't think I completely realized because it was always just accessible to me. His stories were there. He's there. I see him as my friend's father, but I never sat down and filmed him and asked him questions and documented all of the personal conversation that we had. And then when he passed, it was like, man, I had access to all of this history and I never documented it. It's like another fail. You know, so I, I want to make sure that all this stuff gets documented. But that brings up an interesting point when we talk to Scarface and I just talked to Chuck D. One of the concerns is that they don't want hip hop to go the, the wayside of the blues. Mm -hmm. You know, they feel like, okay, it's been absorbed into mainstream culture, but how do we make sure the hip hop remains at its essence and it doesn't become something else? Do you see that happening with hip hop and how do we prevent that from happening? Oh yeah, you can, e if you don't control what it is, it can easily become something else. If you don't 
um, take and accept who you are, someone else is going to take your culture and flip it and do something else to it and not give you the credit for it. So it's up to hip hoppers to document hip hop, right? But the way that you preserve what it is, is to teach the youth exactly where it came from so that their expression at the core of it is hip hop. Right. So when it spreads to different countries, different continents, the still the core of it is hip hop. But the expression is always going to be new because the person is new. Right. In 2136, the expression of hip hop is going to be for a kid that lives in 2136. So it shouldn't sound like 1975 in 2136. Right. It should still be some form of uh the core of it in there, but whatever the new instrument that's made, if that by that time we get to like mental instruments and whatever you want to think about in the future, it can still be a core of hip hop if the lessons are given. If people are making references to things that are from a standpoint of I understand and I know the music. The problem comes when you have curators who don't know the music. So you have some of these guys that are like creating websites and have never really sat down and listened to Criminal Minded and, 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 and De La Soul Records and whoever else you want to name, you know, that are foundation things in, in, in our culture, let alone knowing really Bam and Herc and Flash and, you know, all of these great people that created our culture. How do you feel race plays into hip-hop? Hip-hop has always had that different face. If we really go back and you really talk about hip-hop music and hip-hop culture, some of your greatest graffiti writers like Zephyr and all these guys were white guys, right? People try to take out the Spanish uh, and Puerto Rican influence into some of the greatest b-boys and some of the greatest DJs in the beginning of hip-hop. You can't tell me that the Beastie Boys are not hip-hop. You can't tell me that MC Search is not hip-hop. What I think that people, uh, when they look at when it spreads, the audience themselves may not be hip hop. Macklemore's audience may not be the biggest hip hop audience, but you can't say that Macklemore himself is not hip hop. People are going to have their own expression. You understand what I mean? Like hip hop is not a color based thing, right? It's actually the place where Dr. King's dream is the one place where it's been realized, right? Where it doesn't really matter what color you are. It matters how dope you are. Right. That's all it is. It's, that's what the content of character means. How good are you at what you claim you do? Right. That's hip hop. The only place you could ever see that. I do this for my culture to let them know what it look like when a when a roaster. Show them how to move in a room full of vultures. Industry shady. You need to be taken over. Label owners hate me. I'm raising the status quo up. I'm overcharging for what they did to the cold crush. Pay us like you owe us for all the years that you. We can talk, but money talk, so talk more. About What's the main difference between a beat maker and a producer? Yeah. That's easy. A beat maker just makes the beat, and that sounds cliche ish, but it's like in today's world, that's why the world is sort of leaning guys to be beat makers is because they make the beats by themselves in their one room and then they email it to an artist and they're not in the room when the artist makes the record. Along with production comes uh, vocal production, you know, you're, you're coaching vocally, you're rearranging records, you know, the, the arrangement of a record doesn't always have to be 8 bar intro, 16 bar verse, 8 bar chorus, you know, like the arrangement of the record is up to the producer. You know, when you're working with the artist, they may sing something, rap something that sparks something for you and it, it changes the record. Production means more than just making the beat and sending it to the artist and just letting them put whatever they want over top. So if you just do that, then you and that person help produce the record. But as a producer, you're going to be there, even if you're not in the same room. When the person cuts something and sends it back to you, then you have to say, look, why don't you take this and change it? Why don't you do this? Make this shorter. Say your verses this way. Why don't you whisper something? Why don't you change your vocal inflection on these words? You know, that's production. It's actually getting to the end of finished record. Just a beat is not a finished record. So a producer creates records, a finished record, a beat maker just makes beats.